Are you obedient to God's law? That's quite a question in a world that has, through social norms and subsequent legislation, gradually turned away from God's law. Uh, it's a real challenge in this world today to follow the principles that God gave us when we are being accosted with so many different ideas, rules, regulations that essentially change what God's law is. Uh, that's what I want to talk about uh, today, and I'm going to get into some detail as to how this happened and what can we do to avoid falling into that trap. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to take, uh, have a word of prayer. Dear loving, heavenly, almighty Father, Lord, we are grateful, first of all, that you have given us all life in the, in the first place. But we're in a world where daily we are challenged by all of the new ideas, the uh, social changes that are coming about, many of which conflict with what you gave us. So, Lord, I just pray that through the words today, that I, I, I pray that you'll give me from on high that they not be my ideas, my thoughts, but they should be your thoughts and what you would have for us to understand so that we can avoid falling into the many traps that have been set in this world to pull us away from you. I wait on you patiently now, Lord, as for the words to say, because this is a difficult subject. And I just pray that whoever hears this, that they'll be convicted that there is a better way to live and that we don't have to go along with the crowd. We just thank you, Lord, for all of that. I thank you and praise you. And in Jesus' name I pray and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> Taking liberties with God. Interesting subject. So what are liberties? What does taking liberties really mean? Let's take a look at the definition. It's from the dictionary. One, behave in an unduly familiar manner toward a person. And can you imagine behaving in an unduly familiar manner with Almighty God? I, I can't. I mean, that, that seems like an incredible uh, affront to me. Uh, uh, two, to treat something freely without strict faithfulness to the facts or to an original. And that's actually even more appropriate because it's about being faithful. You know, are we going to be faithful to God? Are we going to follow the principles He gave us? Or are we going to say, oh, you know what the world's telling me to do? That I will do. We live in an age of reason where somehow we have now gotten into a mindset where we know best. We have the answers. And whatever is in the Bible, you know, these old, uh, these books that for many have become dusty old relics in their home, uh, that doesn't matter anymore. What matters is we're living in a different time, a different age, and we want to follow whatever it is that the society has decided is a good thing to do. Now, I, I know that hopefully doesn't apply to many who are hearing this, but I know some of us have that little bit of that mindset. We're just going to go along with the crowd, unfortunately, much in the same way that the crowd uh, went along with choosing Barabbas over Jesus, and that does happen. So I want to get into a little bit about how all of this came about. It goes back a really long way, and actually goes back to King Solomon in many respects. Uh, I don't know that it actually started there. I think we all know that that's not the case, but he certainly set an incredible example, and I want to talk about that. He was a very great king and a leader of Israel, but he had a problem. And let's take a look at that. And this is uh, from the Bible, 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning in the first verse. The Bible says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. Uh, so yeah, he had a little bit of a challenge there. And uh, I think it's also reflective of you know, what some of us have done in our own lives. But let me just go a little bit further and look at what Spirit of Prophecy has to say. This is from Prophets and Kings. 
Above every earthly good, the king desired wisdom and understanding for the accomplishment of the work God had given him to do. He longed for quickness of mind, for largeness of heart, for tenderness of spirit. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and said, Ask what I shall give thee. In his answer, the young and inexperienced ruler gave utterance to his feeling of helplessness and his desire for aid. Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, he said, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Um, so again, Solomon had humbly accepted the role that was given to him. He was determined to do the right thing in God's eyes and in large measure because, because of his dad. It was a very important part of it. First Kings chapter 3, the Bible says, beginning in verse 7, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give, therefore, thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And Solomon also, he, he raised up a prayer before the people at the dedication of the temple that was just absolutely beautiful. I suggest you take a look at that. It's in 1 Kings chapter 8. Uh, but just a beautiful prayer. But as the verse we read told us, Solomon uh, became enamored with strange women. What are, what are strange women? I think we know that in the Bible, it represents other churches, other religions. But there's also a dual meaning here because the verse specifically, the verse we read previously, specifically mentions the daughter of Pharaoh. Uh, in other words, the Egyptian way of life. So it wasn't just a person or a particular church or religion. It was a culture. And Solomon got hooked into that culture by virtue of his association with it. <clears throat> and uh, basically, what that is, is secularism. And secularism is basically the reasoning that people go through and decide, hey, we can do it better. It's our way of doing it. It really has less, a lot less to do with God, and anything goes. You can basically blend belief systems that are antithetical. They're opposites. Just put them all together, mix them all together in a blender, and see what you come up with. And that's referred to as syncretism. Syncretism. That's a process of amalgamating things. Let's take a look at the exact definition from the dictionary. That's the amalgamation or attempted amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. And what happened with this for Solomon uh, was that it, it, it took over his life. And what had happened there became infectious with future generations. Because as we all know, when somebody is a, a great leader and we look up to them, we tend to follow their, in their footsteps. We, we, they, they serve as a kind of a mentor for us. And so a lot of the children of Israel certainly uh, followed some of these principles and they began to turn further and further away from God. Now Ephraim, uh, the tribe uh, uh, the tribe and the term used to identify uh, <clears throat> and characterize ancient Israel committed grievous sins, and I mean grievous sins, by mingling themselves with the very things the Lord had warned them against. This is from uh, Prophets and Kings, Spirit of Prophecy says, uh, of Ephraim the prophet testified, strangers have devoured his strength and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth not. Israel had cast off the thing that is good, broken in judgment, unable to discern the disastrous outcome of their evil course. The ten tribes were soon to be wanderers among the nations. And going on, some of the leaders in Israel felt keenly their loss of prestige and wished that this might be regained. But instead of turning away from those practices which had brought weakness to the kingdom, they continued in iniquity, flattering themselves that when occasion arose, they would attain to political power they desired by allying, allying themselves with the heathen. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, 
Then went Ephraim to the, the Assyrian. Ephraim is also is like a silly dove without heart. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. They do make a covenant with the Assyrians. So interestingly enough, this great apostasy really kind of started out with King Solomon. And what happened subsequently involved Jeroboam. And if we look at uh, 1 Kings 11, beginning in verse 26, and I'm not going to go through all of that, we're told of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, the Ephrathite, Ephrathite of Zerida, and he was from the tribe of Ephraim. And he was a servant of King Solomon, and his mother's name was Zeruah. Uh, so that's his history. And Scripture tells us that he lifted up his hand against the king. Uh, this happened when Jeroboam met, the, uh, Jeroboam met the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, who told him that the Lord would rend the kingdom away from Solomon and, uh, and give the ten tribes, tribes to him, Jeroboam. But the tribe of Judah would remain with the house of David because of the Lord's promise to David. Solomon heard of the prophecy and sought to kill Jeroboam. So this is quite a mess. I mean, this was a real, real controversy. And uh, Jeroboam was, as a result, forced to flee to Egypt, where he basically resided in the household of the Egyptian king Shishak. Uh, and there he remained, actually, until the death of Solomon. Well, you have to realize that if he's living in Egypt, obviously he's going to take on the ways and get familiar with the culture and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, again, we have this potentially this Egyptian philosophy that's been instilled in Jeroboam, which certainly explains some of his behavior. But through the reasoning and philosophy of the Egyptian cultures, Jeroboam became, in a sense, and I say this maybe a little bit in a tongue-in-cheek way, he became what some may call today a left-wing liberal. It was very liberalism. There is basically do what thou wilt. You can do what you like. Never mind God's law. That's not really necessarily applicable. Now, when Solomon's son, Rehoboam, came to power after his father's death, he inherited an awful lot of problems, uh, not the least of which was excessive taxation. And uh, the people complained about that. They appeared before Rehoboam. And uh, he, they were represented by Jeroboam. And this is where the, the split began in the kingdom, you know, between the, what ultimately became the northern kingdom and uh, Judah. Uh, so ultimately, Jeroboam became one of the most noteworthy of all of the evil kings of Israel. It was very, very, this very important. And it began to turn the people away from God. And uh, basically did that with his... <laughs> for lack of a better way of putting it, his liberal anti-scripture practices and policies. And uh, that greatly angered the Lord. And we see that if we look at 1 Kings 14, beginning in verse 7, the Bible says, Go tell Jeroboam, and the Lord said this to Ahijah the prophet, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, For as much as I exalted thee from among the people, and made thee prince over my people Israel, and rent the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to thee. And yet thou hast not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that, to do that only which was right in mine eyes, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and has cast me behind thy back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam, as a man taketh away dung, till it be all gone. I would certainly say the Lord was angered by Jeroboam's behavior. There's no question about that. So, the apostasy that had overcome Israel and was already taking them away from the Lord was only exacerbated by Jeroboam's behavior and the example that he set. He really accelerated that process and carried the children of Israel even further away from the Lord in the behaviors that they exhibited. And they ev eventually they were destroyed by the Assyrians. So let's look at what the Bible says in 1 Kings 14. Beginning uh, in verse 15, the Bible says, For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of his good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, 
because they have made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Very key statement in scripture. Uh, that's what the Jeroboam was most noted for, that he was the one that made Israel to sin at that point in time. They had already gone off track. They had the example of what happened with Solomon, unfortunately, and it only continued to grow and to grow until they turned so far away from the Lord that they had to be destroyed. And that was the, that was the end of that. So in, in any event, this represents for us, it's, it's an antitype. It represents basically what's happening today in Christianity because little by little we're amalgamating uh, pagan and anti, uh, uh, unbiblical beliefs uh, into, into our lives. And that's just part of what's happening with our society. And even worse, we're relying on our, on our own reasoning instead of following God's counsels. I think that happens a lot, and I, I don't think there's a single person that isn't guilty at some point in his life of disregarding what we know to be the truth and doing something a different way. It happens. You know, we all uh, have a sinful nature, and that's what we do. But we're endeavoring in our society today to form a new, less stringent Christianity, one that's not so dogmatic, is what people say anyway. And so we need a different version of that. So the world around us is now taking liberties with God by eliminating biblical principles they just don't like or it just doesn't jive with the values or the mores of a modern society. It just doesn't fit anymore. So they say, oh, let's do away with this. And there's an ongoing movement to rewrite or completely discount the offensive language or the offensive scriptures so that they fit into a more acceptable contemporary framework. And we see this uh, just as an example. Uh, we have family members that are LGBT. They're in the LGBT movement. And in their church, they have basically dissected, for example, the books, Book of Romans. They have their own Bible. Uh, so some of those verses were the, the clobber verses, and they just took them and threw them out. And this is happening to a great extent in a lot of churches and in a lot of uh, uh, areas around the, the Protestant denominations. It's very, very unfortunate. In fact, over the past century, we have systematically deviated from biblical principles in our society that stood as pillars for literally thousands of years. And, uh, you know, just as an example, uh, even in th some of the things that we do in our, in our world, like agriculture, uh, we have wandered away from what the Bible's counsels are in agriculture. And it used to be we let the fields lie fallow in the seventh year. We don't do that anymore. We had to push the crops more rapidly because we had more people, population growth. So as a result, uh, over the last century or so, we began to do exactly that, and we depleted the soils. Well, that meant we needed to add artificial chemical fertilizers to be able to grow the crops. And unfortunately, those fertilizers like NPK, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, are only the primary elements plants need to thrive. So as a result, plants get sick, they get attacked by bugs, we have to spray them with insecticides, we develop herbicides to keep the weeds away. Before you know it, you have toxic food. That's just one of many, many examples, but that was a biblical principle that we simply let go of. Same thing with, uh, with marriage. You know, going back, uh, if we go back to the turn of the, the 20th century, I think people at that time probably were a lot closer uh, to the Word of God. They probably read their Bible more of the time. I believe that was the case. I think that's certainly provable. And so we, we saw that uh, divorce was, was a very rare occurrence. And some of these other things didn't happen either. But over time, by the time we reached the 90s and now into the 2000s, uh, virtually every, it's one out of two marriages ends in divorce. That never happened before. I believe it was one in 12 going all the way back many, many decades. And it's continually uh, changed over the last, uh, last many decades and gotten way worse. So this is what we're doing in our world. We're changing those principles that held us together, that held us closer to God, that kept us doing the things we need to do so that uh, our lives would be better. And instead, we've gone in the opposite direction. It, it, it's very frightening to see what's happening in our society right now, and unfortunately, Unfor very unfortunately, even in our own church. Something dreadful has happened to our reasoning. 
uh, we're rationalizing behaviors that simply fly in the face of biblical precedent. Uh, we find ways to rationalize virtually anything. Uh, we all know, for example, the Sabbath is one of the pillars of our faith. That's already been attacked and metamorphosed into Sunday worship, and even in some of our own churches it has happened. And in fact, it's interesting to note, going back in history, that the Emperor Constantine, who was instrumental in instituting Sunday worship, followed the same paradigm that Solomon did when he sinned against God. And this is how. Constantine was a brilliant politician. Instead of murdering countless Christians, as the Roman leaders before him had done, like Nero and Diocletian, uh, he found a way to bring the masses together through, uh, through ecumenism, you know, blending the pagan beliefs with Christianity. He just blended the two together. It was an amalgamation. And it was this hybridized religion that characterized the er early church. Sadly, that's what's happening today. It's the same thing. If we take a look at the great controversy, this is what Ellen White has to say about, about that. And this is very, I, I love this, this, this passage in the Great Controversy, uh, Great Controversy, it really sums it up well. Little by little, at first in stealth and silence, and then more openly as it increased in strength and gained control of the minds of men, the mystery of iniquity carried forward its deceptive and blasphemous work. Almost imperceptibly, the customs of heathenism found their way into the Christian church. The spirit of compromise and conformity was restrained for a time by the fierce persecutions which the church endured under paganism. But as persecution ceased, and of course we don't have any persecution really, truly, in our churches today. We don't have to worry about where we worship, at least at the moment. So we're free to do what we will. But as the persecution ceased and Christianity entered the courts and palaces of kings, she laid aside the humble simplicity of Christ and his apostles for the pomp and pride of pagan priests and rulers, and in place of the requirements of God, she substituted human theories and traditions. Are we not doing that today? That's exactly what's happening in our churches. And the really frightening part is that, similar to ages past, laws are being enacted uh, to bring the populace in line with what's deemed politically correct. And I could get into that subject ad nauseum, but this is a, a trend that's happening in our world. And, and friends, this is a very frightening thing because we're changing the very nature of the way Christianity used to be. It, it's not the same thing anymore today. Freedom of conscience is being sacrificed for conformity and the creation of a society with a uniformity that seems to come straight out of the works of George Orwell. I mean, that's what we're doing in our society. And uh, of course, he was an by the way, an outspoken supporter of democratic socialism, just as an aside. Uh, we've redefined you know, the institutions of marriage, of sexual identity, and, and even the practices associated with everything from agriculture uh, to economics. And agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, we've changed our system of economics. We have done everything that gradually, over time, has moved further and further away from biblical precedent. And it's become virtually impossible to challenge any of the social or political ide ideologies without, without becoming a target of hatred and vindictiveness. I think we've all seen in the media what happens to people if they try today to stand for what's right. They're going to be attacked. It's simply the way it is. And in the midst of it all, the Bible's been left behind. There are many who actually believe that the Bible's counsels are outmoded, biased, and unreasonable in a progressive society. This is the thinking of many people in our world today. So how could this be? You know, one belief that most Christian denominations, if not all of them, have in common is that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Looking at what uh, Scripture says, this is in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And this is a common belief. I mean, is it? Do we believe it? Is this what we genuinely believe? Now, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 
I know when I read that, it really it resonates with me because very often God's word just cuts like a knife. You know, when you're doing something that violates biblical principle, you, you could feel that. At least I do. I feel that in my heart. Uh, I know it's something that God doesn't approve of, and I feel very uncomfortable and even agitated. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do it. <laughs> There's times I've done it, but it's still, you can feel that. You can feel that little twinge inside knowing that this is, this is not the right thing. And this is particularly true when you're struggling with a behavior in life that maybe you feel you simply can't change. In fact, it can be very painful. It causes considerable self-deprecation. But the biblical truth, nonetheless, still remains. Regardless of our discomfort, regardless of our efforts to rationalize it, the biblical truth remains. It, it's, it remains unadulterated. And considering the impingement that society is making on biblical principles such as, uh, as marriage, uh, they've, these things have stood as pillars uh, for countless millions. We have an enormous paradox on our hands with this. The Bible says one thing, and our society and civil law says another. How do we reconcile that? Obviously, the only way to reconcile that is to rewrite or completely eliminate the offending scriptures in the Bible, as I mentioned earlier, something that's actually been happening over the last few decades uh, uh, particularly. Uh, but the Bible says, John 1, which is certainly a memory verse, should be for almost everyone, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. If we endeavor to alter the Bible, it would essentially be the equivalent of doing a makeover for God himself. I mean, that's what it really boils down to. We cannot alter the Bible. That leads me to the main point of this message. It's about a pattern of reasoning, I say reasoning, and rationalization that is now rampant, even in our own churches, uh, all churches, not, not just our specific church. And in short, it's a repeat of history. This is not the first time this has happened. This is a replay of things that have happened in ages past. We already took, it the, uh, took a look at the brief, briefly at the struggle between ancient Israel leading up to the apostasy uh, and the ultimate destruction. But there's an event in history that so closely parallels what's happening, especially in the United States and our country right now, that's absolutely startling, absolutely startling. And that event is the French Revolution. There are so many parallels there. And uh, for those that don't remember their history, um, here's a partial description of what the French Revolution was about. This is uh, from Wikipedia. The French Revolution was a period of far-reaching social and political upheaval in France that lasted from 1789 until 1799 and was particular, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and was partially carried forward by Napoleon during the later expansion of the French Empire. The revolution overthrew the monarchy, established a republic, experienced violent periods of political turmoil, and finally culminated in a dictatorship under Napoleon that rapidly brought many of its principles to Western Europe and beyond. Inspired by liberal and radical ideas, the revolution profoundly altered the course of modern history, triggering the global decline of absolute monarchies while replacing them with republics and liberal democracies. It goes on to say that during the reign of terror, extreme efforts of de-Christianization ensued. Does that sound familiar? Certainly some of what's happening in our society right now including the imprisonment and massacre of priests and destruction of churches and religious images throughout France. An effort was made to replace the Catholic Church altogether with civic festivals replacing religious ones. The establishment of the cult of reason was the final step of radical de-Christianization. And for those who are unfamiliar with it, the cult of reason was a belief system that was established in France intended literally as a replacement for Christianity during the French Revolution. That's what it was for. And it goes on in Wikipedia, globally the French Revolution accelerated the rise of republics and democracies. It became the focal point for the development of all modern political ideologies leading to the spread of, get this, liberalism, radicalism, 
nationalism, socialism, feminism, and secularism, among many others. So it's very interesting that, you know, a lot of our ideologies in the country today grew out of the French Revolution. It's a parallel. It's, uh, it's a parallel to where we're at. And it's really all about atheism. And quite frankly, that's where we're headed because we're relying more on man's laws, man's ideas, than on biblical principles. So in fact, that is the direction that we're going. In short, the French Revolution was about worshiping the goddess of reason, the goddess of reason, and as relying upon our own human understanding and reasoning abilities to form our own doctrines. Uh, and they're unfortunately often contrary to the Bible. Does it sound like the world today? It sure does. Matthew 15, the Bible says, beginning in verse 8, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, te the, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Nothing like making up our own rules to circumvent biblical principle. You know, Ellen White had a few very profound things to say about the French Revolution. I want to share that because I think this is very significant. So it begins uh, uh, in the great controversy. Uh, the war against the Bible carried forward for so many centuries in France culminated in the scenes of the revolution. That terrible outbreaking was but the legitimate result of Rome's suppression of the scriptures. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this, in, in this manner be killed. Revelation 11.5, men cannot with impunity trample upon the word of God. The meaning of this fearful denunciation, and again, just to interrupt for a minute, going back to what we talked about with Jeroboam and what happened to, to the children of Israel because of his example, well, they were ultimately destroyed. And so here we have, again, that, that same concept echoed, men cannot with impunity trample upon the word of God. The meaning of this fearful denunciation is set forth in the closing chapter of the Revelation. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And she goes on, just to go a little further, such are the warnings which God has given to guard men against changing in any manner that which he was revealed, uh, which, which he has revealed or commanded. These solemn denunciations apply to all who by their influence lead men to regard lightly the law of God. They should, uh, they should cause those to fear and tremble who flippantly declare it is a matter of little consequence whether we obey God's law or not. All who exalt their own opinions above divine revelation, all who would change the plain meaning of Scripture to suit their own convenience, as I was mentioning earlier, or for the sake of conforming to the world, again, another point I, uh, that I made previously, are taking upon themselves a fearful responsibility. The written word, the law of God, will measure the character of every man and condemn all whom this unerring test shall declare wanting. Very, very powerful words. One more uh, uh, passage that I want to share. France presented also the characteristics which especially distinguished Sodom. During the revolution, there was manifest a state of moral, moral debasement and corruption similar to that which brought destruction upon the cities of the plain. And the historian presents together the atheism and the licentiousness of France as given in the prophecy. Intimately connected with these laws affecting religion was that which reduced the union of marriage the most sacred engagement which human beings can form and the permanence of which leads most strongly to the consolidation of society, to the state of a mere civil contract of a transitory character which any two persons might engage in and cast loose at pleasure. That's really incredible statements. Just one more passage. If fiends had set themselves to work 
to discover a mode of most effectually destroying whatever is venerable, graceful, or permanent in domestic life, and of obtaining at the same time an assurance that the mischief which it was their object to create should be perpetuated from one generation to another, they could not have invented a more effectual plan than the degradation of marriage." Very, very strong words. And when you look at these things without the road, uh, these statements without the rose-colored glasses uh, and the concerns we all face in everyday life, it's pretty clear that we must be nearing the end of this world's history. And there's no question about it when we look at these events unfolding. Friends, it's not just about papal directives or, uh, and the incoming Sunday laws. No, it's not just about that. It's about dismembering of biblical principles and of a society that is very rapidly and defiantly turning away from God. That's what it's really all about. It's about a movement that worships the goddess of reason rather than the god of the universe. It's a movement designed to create a new religion, one that bears really little resemblance to Christianity. This is from uh, Last Day Events. When Protestant churches shall unite with the secular power to sustain a false religion, opposing that for which their ancestors endured the fiercest persecution, there will be a national apostasy which will end only in national ruin. You can find many prophetic insights in uh, Daniel chapter 11 related to all of the events I've been speaking about. Uh, I just wish I had time to get into that. Basically, we're redefining Christianity every day. Uh, we seem to have a very divergent view in our society of what Christianity actually is. And uh, uh, just as an aside, I happened to catch a, a, this, this little minuscule example one, uh, one day as I was l browsing on the internet uh, doing some research. Uh, and it, it was just very interesting to me. And it's about this company, and I, certainly no, nothing negative intended here, but ChristianBooks.com or ChristianBook.com has the slogan, Everything Christian for Less. And my question is, is everything Christian that you could purchase through ChristianBook.com? Again, I'm not putting them down, but what we have out there are all these different avenues where we can purchase things that supposedly represent our faith, whether they're Bibles or commentary or whatever the case may be. But certainly not everything you purchase there is of a, a, a Christian nature. Uh, it, it may not be, uh, uh, may not track with the Bible or with, you know, with God's law. So it's just kind of interesting. Then, of course, we have the so-called Christian music, uh, which many defend. Uh, because they say, well, the lyrics are certainly of, of a Christian nature. They talk about Christ and so on. But what few realize is that it's not about that. It's about the music itself. It's about the backbeat. It's about the nature of the music. And we can go on and on. There's a lot of information out there about that. But uh, basically, Christianity is metamorphosing into something entirely new. It's not the same religion today as it was centuries ago. Paul and the disciples would probably hardly recognize our faith today. If they walked into many of our churches, they'd be stunned by some of the things they see because it really doesn't reflect the simplicity that the disciples experienced when they walk with Christ. It's just not the same. It's not the same. Now, this is really interesting. Uh, I want to just go through a couple of things related to what's happening in our society very quickly. That's uh, an article... Uh, Faith leaders urge government to support LGBT education in schools. Uh, this is becoming a trend, very, very dangerous one at that. Religious leaders quotes on LGBT people, gay marriage and homosexuality. And uh, this is what Pope Francis said was a quote, who am I to judge a gay person of goodwill who seeks the Lord? Uh, let me just point out, I'm not in any way putting any of this down or in any way... Uh, <laughs> judging anybody who is LGBT. As I said, some of our own relatives are LGBT, so I'm not putting anyone down. I'm just simply drawing a comparison between where we once were and where we are in terms of what the Bible says. That's what we need to be thinking about. And I'll let you be the judge of that. I'm, not, I'm certainly not doing it. Makers of Seventh Gay Adventist, the movie, say new film project answers the question, what next? So now they're taking that to another level. A film that apparently caused quite a bit of controversy is now going to take things even to the next level. 
and creating better faith-based children's stories. And this is uh, Deneen Akers, who was one of the people involved in the Seventh Day Ad Adventist Project, producing a book that's going to introduce young people to the, all the LGBT concepts and bring that down to very some of the <laughs> some of our younger uh, our children and and teach them that you can have LGBT heroes. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, the if you look at the I think the title of the book or certainly the the theme of the book. Uh, let's see, uh, as I look at this, you are working on a new book for children, and it's actually called Holy Troublemakers and Unconventional Saints. So who is the book aimed at? LGBT Adventists can find hope in the Adventist civil rights movement. So again, this is becoming a big thing within the church. Hollywood SDA Church appoints first transgender elder. And this is something to illustrate just how far off the track we've gotten, and I'm talking now about mainstream Christianity and some of the key people that are recognized as leaders in the Christian world. And in this case, uh, it's Pat Robertson, and this is a comment he made that when I read it, and actually it was a video, so I, I saw it, I read the, the narrative, it, it was just, to me it was stunning, uh, because basically it conflicts with what the Bible says, and this is becoming a commonplace event. And this is a quote from him. <sighs> When, they, when asked about the question of uh, evolution, uh, this, is, this was his response. There, there ain't no way that's possible. It's about the age of the earth and about evolution. And he said, there ain't no way that's possible. Anybody that's in the oil business knows that he is drilling down uh, two, three, or four miles through the ground, and you're coming into all these layers laid down by the dinosaurs, and we have skeletons of dinosaurs that go back about 65 million years. And to say that it all came about in 6,000 years is just nonsense. And I think it's about time we come off of that stuff and say that this is impossible. So there was a Big Bang. That doesn't mean it came spontaneously. Nobody knows what caused the Big Bang, but I say God did it. We've got to be realistic about all of this. The dating of Bishop Usher just doesn't compare to anything that is found in science. You can't just totally deny the geological formations that are out there. We found a Tyrannosaurus out there in Oregon, a full skeleton. That baby was laid down about 65 million years ago. So let's be real. Let's not make a joke of ourselves. He actually said this, and Pat Robertson is followed by a lot of people. So again, I'm not putting the man down. I'm just simply pointing out what he said, and we know what the book of Genesis says. So again, you be the judge. Uh, this is a quote from Billy Graham. I don't think that there's any conflict at all between science today and the scriptures. I think that we have misinterpreted the scriptures many times and we've tried to make the scriptures say things they weren't meant to say. I think that we've made a mistake by thinking the Bible is a scientific book. The Bible is not a book of science. The Bible is a book of redemption and of course I accept the creation story. I believe that God did create the universe. I believe that God created man, and whether it came by an evolutionary process, and at a certain point he took this person or being and made him a living soul or not, does not change the fact that God did create man. Whichever way God did it makes no difference as to what man is and man's relationship to God. Again, poses a lot of questions in people's minds. This comes from Pope Francis. God created beings and allowed them to develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so that they were able to develop and to arrive at their fullness of being. He gave autonomy to the beings of the universe at the same time at which he assured them of his continuous presence, giving being to every reality. And so creation continued for centuries and centuries, millennia and millennia, until it became what we know today, precisely because God is not a, a demurge or a magician, uh, but the creator who gives being uh, to all things. The Big Bang, which nowadays is posited as the origin of the world, does not contradict the divine act of creating, but rather requires it. The evolution of nature does not contrast with the notion of creation, as evolution presupposes the creation of beings that evolve. So quite interesting. And uh, again, in the Spectrum magazine, the creation, evolution, false dilemma, that gets into rather controversial comments. And here's an excerpt from that. There's recently an evangelical Christian organization called The Truth Project released a film in the United States titled, Is Genesis History? 
Its claim to be a documentary would be disputed by virtually all scientists working in relevant fields, but the science community is not the target audience. It is intended to help persuade Christians to affirm Young Earth Creationism, YEC, which is the film's developers likely, which the film's developers likely believe is the only correct way to understand Genesis. There are, of course, people with relevant scientific degrees who believe in YEC, and some of them work for organizations that promote this view. However, compared with the total number of scientists in these fields, the YEC numbers are minuscule. And here's a key quote, the false dilemma is a fallacy of oversimplification that offers a limited number of options, usually two, when in reality more options are available. Also known as the either or fallacy, the fallacy of the excluded middle, <coughs> excuse me, and the black and white fallacy, either or arguments are fallacious because they tend to reduce complex issues to simplistic choices. Why do we even debate these subjects? I think to me the bottom line is, do we believe what scripture says or are we going to continually analyze, uh, rationalize, recreate? Uh, I, I just don't get it. And I'm a very scientific individual, by the way, but what I say, good science is biblical. I've always believed that. So what can we do? What can we do to circumvent all this and remain faithful in a world that has basically been filled with, with deceptions and, in many cases, outright blasphemies. What can we do? In the first place, take time to study and know the Bible. I mean, that's so crucial. I mean, it's such a simple thing. We really need to spend more time studying and know what the Bible actually says. So when something happens or someone poses an idea, we'll know. Does it track with what we believe as Christians? Or, or is it uh, man's idea? Go back and study history to appreciate and recognize how we're repeating old mistakes and learn how you can avoid them. You know, that's one of the key things. We need to learn from our mistakes in history. Very important. And three, don't adopt worldly principles and ideologies. Well, that's a pretty broad statement, but I mean, it's, you know, once we understand what the Bible says and we see how things are being radically changed, we can avoid that. We don't have to go with the flow. In fact, we need to stand our ground. What did the Protestant reformers do? They were not afraid to die for what they believed in. Four, stay away from worldly entertainment and focus on spiritual matters. Good grief, so many people have filled their homes with uh, entire libraries of uh, motion pictures and entertainment industry related items. I, I mean, it, it's affected so many people, not just their children. Uh, many of us are getting hooked into the world of Hollywood. We need to avoid that because that's all, it, it's not real. And all of this is going to go away eventually. We need to focus on spiritual matters, get our minds back into God's Word, and take time to pray. We need more of that. Stand your ground to defend the truth, even if it means people may hate you for it. Now, how many of us are willing to do that? <laughs> Boy, is that a challenge. How many of us are going to stand our ground even when we're hated? I think we're so worried about what people think about us that we're willing to do whatever it takes to make to please them. And yet, the one person we should be pleasing gets left out of the equation, and that's God. Don't rationalize sinful behavior or change the meaning of what it is to be a Christian. It's pretty simple. If we read our Bibles, we know what it means to know Christ. We know who Christ is. If we're going to do something different and accept a different version of the Bible, I'm not talking about Bible versions per se. I'm talking about what society is doing to the laws, the, the, uh, uh, the councils and so forth that are in the Bible, changing those. Uh, are we going to go along with that or rationalize that? So just to sum it all up, one very simple statement and something to think about as you go through your day. We don't define Christianity. Christianity defines us. It's all, about, it's all about knowing Christ, and it's all about living our lives in, according, in accordance with the counsels and the principles that he gave us, not the principles that are evolving through societal norms and the changes that they're bringing about. I think it's important for all of us to remember it's not going to get easier. It's only going to get more difficult as time goes on. So now would be the time to really go back to basics and start studying our Bibles and remember how much God loves us and why he's given us all the counsels that we have. 
So on that note, I'm going to close with a word of prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, Lord, it seems that each day life gets more challenging in this world. And we just can't wait for that final moment to come where all the pain, the suffering, the confusion, all these things that we deal with every day will finally be gone. But in the meantime, Lord, I just pray that we can all find a way to circumvent all the traps that have been set out there for us to draw us away from you. It's a very challenging world. And Lord, we just pray for all of those who have lost their way and have become confused over all the the new rules and regulations and ways of doing things and how they've permeated our society. Help us, Lord, to remember that there's a much more simple way, and that is your way. Please be with each one of us. Help us each day to remain steadfast in our faith and to not let the things of this world interfere with that. And most of all, to remember the mistakes of the past so we don't go down the same, the same path. I give you thanks and praise and pray to go in peace myself today. For all of this I pray in Jesus' holy and precious and wonderful name and for his sake. Amen.